All right, I do not have a lot of time, so we're just gonna jump right in. Love in the Time of Cholera, chapter five, part two, page 243, near the bottom. It was far from easy. Miss Lynch wanted her honor protected. She was give, she wanted security and love in that order, and she believed that she deserved them. She gave Dr. Urbino the opportunity to, to, opportunity to seduce her, but not to penetrate her inner sanctum, even when she was alone in the house. She would go no further than allowing him to repeat the ceremony of palpitation and auscultation with all the ethical violations he could desire, but without taking off her clothes. For his part, he could not let go of the bait once he had bitten, and he continued his almost daily incursions. For reasons of practical nature, it was close to impossible for him to maintain a continuing relationship with Miss Lynch, but he was too weak to stop, as he would later be too weak to go any further. This was his limit. The Reverend Lynch did not lead a regular life, for he would ride away on his mule on the spur of the moment, carrying Bibles and evangelical pamphlets on one side and provisions on the other, and he would return when least expected. Another difficulty was the school across the street, for the children would recite their lessons as they looked out the windows, and what they saw with the greatest clarity was the house across the way, with its doors and windows open wide from six o'clock in the morning. They saw Miss Lynch hanging the birdcage from the eaves so that the tropical tribule could learn the recited lessons. They saw her wearing a bright colored turban and going about her household tasks as she, she recited along with them in her brilliant Caribbean voice. And later they saw her sitting on the porch reciting the afternoon psalms by herself in English. They had to choose a time when the children were not there and there were only two possibilities, the afternoon recess for lunch between 12 and two, which was also when the doctor had his lunch or late in the afternoon when the children had gone home. This was always the best time, although by then the doctor had made his rounds and only had a few minutes to spare before it was time for him to eat with his family. The third problem, and the most serious for him, was his own situation. It was not possible for him to go there without his carriage, which was very well known, and always had to wait outside her door. He could have made an accomplice of his coachman and did most of his friends at the social club, but that was not in his nature. In fact, when his visits to Miss Lynch became too obvious, the livery liveried family coachman himself, dared to ask if it would not be better for him to come back later so that the carriage would not spend so much time at her door. Dr. Rubino, in a sharp response that was not typical of him, cut him off. This is the first time I have known you and I have heard you say something you should not have, he said. Well then, I will assume it was never said. There was no solution. In a city like this, it was impossible to hide an illness when the doctor's carriage stood at, stood at the door. At times, the doctor himself took the initiative and went on foot, if distance permitted, or in a hired carriage to avoid malicious or prema premature assumptions. Such deceptions, however, were too little avail, since the prescriptions ordered in pharmacies revealed the truth. Dr. Rubina would always prescribe uh, counterfeit medicines along with the correct ones in order to preserve the sacred right of the sick to die in peace along with the secret of their illness. Similarly, he was able in various truthful ways to account for the presence of his carriage along the house of Miss Lynch, but he could not allow it to stay there too long, least of all for the amount of time he would have desired, which was the rest of his life. The world had become a hell for him. For once the initial madness was sated, they both became aware of the risks involved, and Dr. Juvenal Urbino had never had the resolve to face a scandal. In the, del in the deliriums of passion, he promised everything, but when it was over, everything he uh, was left for later. On the other hand, as his desire to be with her grew, so did his fear of losing her, so that their meetings became more and more hurried and problematic. He thought about nothing else. He waited for the afternoons with unbearable longing. He forgot his other commitments. He forgot everything but her. But at his car but as his carriage approached the Mala Crianza salt march, he prayed to God that an unforeseen obstacle would force it to drive past. He went to her in a state of such anguish that at times, as he turned the corner, he was glad to catch a glimpse of the woolly head of Reverend Lynch, to, who read on the terrace while his daughter catechized neighborhood children in the living room with recited passages of scripture. Then he would go home relieved that he was not defying fate again. But later he would find himself going mad with the desire for it to be five o'clock in the afternoon, all day, every day. So their love became impossible when the carriage at her door became too conspicuous, and after three months it became nothing less than ridiculous. Without time to say anything, Miss Lynch would go to the bedroom as soon as she saw her agitated lover walk in the door. She took the precaution of wearing a full skirt on the days she expected him, a charming skirt from Jamaica with red flower, flowered ruffles, but with no underwear. Nothing in the belief that this convenience was going to help him ward off his fear. 
but he squandered everything she did to make him happy. Panting and drenched with perspiration, he rushed after her into the bedroom, throwing everything on the floor, his walking stick, his medical bag, bag his Panama hat, and he made panic-stricken lo love with the trousers down around his knees with his jacket buttoned so that he would not get in his way. With his gold washed chain across his vest, with his shoes on, with everything on, and more concerned with leaving as soon as possible than achieving pleasure. She was left dangling, barely at the entrance of her tunnel of solitude, while he was already buttoning up again, as exhausted as if he had made absolute love on the divining line between life and death, when in reality he had accomplished no more than the physical act that is only part of the feat of love. But he had finished in time, the exact time needed to give an injection during a routine visit. Then he returned home, ashamed of his weakness, longing for death, cursing himself for the lack of courage that kept him from asking for Mina Daza to pull down his trousers and burn his ass on the brazier. Uh, middle of 246. He did not eat. He said his prayers without conviction in bed. He pretended to continue his siesta reading while his wife walked round and round the house, putting the world in order before going to bed. As he nodded over his book, he began to sink o down into the inevitable mangrove swamp of Miss Lynch, into the, her air of a recumbent forest glade, his deathbed, and then he could think of nothing except tomorrow's five minutes to five o'clock in the afternoon, and her waiting for him in bed with nothing but the mound of her dark bush under her madwoman's skirt from Jamaica, the hellish circle. In the past few years, he had become conscious of the burden of his own body. He recognized the symptoms. He had read about them in textbooks. He had seen them confirmed in real life in older patients with no history of serious ailments who suddenly began to describe perfect syndromes that seemed to come straight from medical texts and yet turned out to be imaginary. His professor of children's clinical medicine at La Salle had recommended pediatrics as the most honest specialization because children become sick only when in fact they are sick and they cannot communicate with the physician using conventional words but only with concrete symptoms of real diseases. After a certain age, however, adults either have the symptoms without the diseases or, what was worse, serious diseases with the symptoms of minor ones. He distracted them with palliatives, giving time enough to teach them not to feel their ailments so that they could live with them in the rubbish heap of old age. Dr. Juvenal Urbino never thought that a physician his age, who believed he had seen everything, would not be able to overcome the uneasy feeling that he was ill when he was not. Or, what was worse, not believe he was, out of pure scientific pre prejudice, when perhaps he really was. At the age of 40, half in earnest and half in jest, he had said in class, All I need in life is someone who understands me. But when he found himself lost in the labyrinth of Miss Lynch, he no longer was jesting. All the real or imaginary symptoms of his older patients made their appearance in his body. He felt the shape of his liver with such clarity that he could tell its size without touching it. He felt the dozing cat's purr of his kidneys. He felt the iridescent brilliance of his vesicles. He felt the humming blood in his art arteries. At times, he awoke at dawn, gasping for air like a fish out of water. He had fluid in his heart. He felt it lose the beat for a moment. He felt it syncopate like a school marching band once, twice, and then, because God is good, he felt it recover at last. But instead of having, to rec having recourse to the same distracting remedies he gave to his patients, he went mad with terror. It was true. All he needed in life, even at the age of 58, was someone who understood him. So he turned to Fermita Daza, the person who loved him best and who he loved best in the world and uh, whom he loved best in the world and whom he had just eased his conscience. For his, for this occurred after she interrupted his afternoon reading to ask him to look at her and he had the first indication that his hellish circle had been discovered, but he did not know how because it would have been impossible for him to conceive of Fermina Dawes' learning the truth by smell alone. In any case, for a long time, this had not been a good city for keeping secrets. Soon after the first home telephones were installed, several marriages that seemed stable were destroyed by anonymous tale bearing calls, and a number of frightened family, families either canceled their service or refused to have a telephone for many years. Dr. Urbino knew that his wife had too much self-respect to allow so much as an attempt at anonymous betrayal by telephone, and he could not imagine anyone daring to try it under his own name. But he feared the old method, a note slipped slipped under the door by an unknown hand could be effective not only because it guaranteed the double anonymity of sender and receiver, but because its time-honored ancestry permitted one to attribute it to it some kind of metaphysical connection to the designs of divine providence. Jealousy was unknown in his house. 
Uh, during more than 30 years of conjugal peace, Dr. Urbino had often boasted in public, and until now it had been true, that he was like those Swedish matches that light only with their... their <sighs> that only mat light with their own box. Hmm. But he did not know how a woman was, with as much pride, dig dignity, and strength of character as his wife would react in the face of proven infidelity. So that after looking at her as she had asked, nothing occurred to him but to lower his eyes again in order to hide his embarrassment and continue the pretense of being lost among the sweet, meandering rivers of Elka Island until he could think of something else. Fermina Daza, for her part, said nothing more either. When she finished darning her, the socks, she tossed everything into the sewing basket in no particular order, gave instructions in the kitchen for supper, and went to the bedroom. Then he reached the admirable decision not to go to Miss Lynch's house at five o'clock in the afternoon. The vows of eternal love, the dream of a discreet house for her alone, where he could visit her with no unexpected interruptions, their unhurried happiness for as long as they lived, everything he had promised in the blazing heat of love was cancelled forever after. The last thing Miss Lynch received from him was an emerald tiara in a little box wrapped in paper from the pharmacy, so the coachman himself thought it was an emergency prescription and handed it to her with no comment, no message, nothing in writing. Dr. Rubino never saw her again, not even by accident, and God alone knows how much grief his heroic resolve cost him or how many bitter tears he had to shed behind locked lavatory doors in order to survive this private catastrophe. At five o'clock, instead of going to see her, he made a profound act of contrition before his confessor, and on the following Sunday, he took communion, his heart broken, but his soul at peace. That night, following his renunciation, as he was undressing for bed, he recited for Fermina Daza the bitter litany of his early morning insomnia, his sudden stabbing pains, his desire to weep in the afternoon, the encoded symptoms of secret love, which he recounted as if they were the miseries of old age. He had to tell someone or die, or else the truth tell the truth, and so the relief he obtained was sanctified with the domestic rituals of love. She listened to him with close attention, but without looking at him, without saying anything, as she picked up every article of clothing he removed, sniffed it, and with no gesture or change or ex of expression that might betray her wrath, then crumpled it and tossed it into the wicker basket for dirty clothes. She did not find the odor, but it was all the same. Tomorrow was another day before he knelt down to pray before the altar in the bedroom. He ended the recital of his misery with a sigh as mournful as it was sincere. I think I am going to die. She did not even blink when she replied. That would be best, she said. Then we could both have some peace. Years before, during the crisis of a dangerous illness, he had spoken, spoken of the possibility of dying, and she made the same brutal reply. Dr. Urbino uh, attributed it to the natural hard-heartedness hard of women, which allows the earth to continue revolving around the sun because at the time he did not know that she always erected a barrier of, of wrath to hide her fear. And in this case, it was the most terrible one of all, the fear of losing him. That night, on the other hand, she wished him dead with all her heart, and this certainty alarmed him. Then he heard her slow sobbing in the darkness as she bit the pillow she would so he would not hear. He was puzzled because he knew that she did not cry easily for any affliction of body or soul. She cried only in rage, above all if it had its origins in terror or culpability, and then the more she cried, the more enraged she became because she could not forgive herself, forgive her weakness in crying. He did not dare to console her, knowing that it would have been like consoling a tiger run through by a spear, and he did not have the courage to tell her that the reason for her weeping had disappeared that afternoon, had been pulled out by the roots forever, even from his memory. Fatigue overcame him for a few minutes. When he awoke, she had her lit, she had lit her dim bedside lamp and lay there with her eyes open, but without crying. Something definitive had happened to her while she slept. While he slept, the sediment that had accumulated at the bottom of her life over the course of so many years had been stirred up by the torrent of her jealousy and had floated to the surface, and it had aged her all at once. Shocked by her sudden wrinkles, her faded lips, the ashes in her hair, he risked telling her that she should try sleeping. It was after two o'clock. She spoke not looking at him, but with no trace of anger in her voice, almost with gentleness. I have a right to know who she is, she said. And then he told her everything, feeling as if he were lifting the weight of the world from his shoulders because he was convinced that she already knew and only needed to confirm the details, 
but she did not, of course, so that as he spoke, she began to cry again, not with her earlier timid sobs, but with abundant salty tears that ran down her cheeks and burned her nightdress and inflamed her life, because he had not done what she, with her heart in her mouth, had hoped he would do, which was to be a man, deny everything, and swear on his life it was not true, and grow indignant at the false accusation and shout curses at his ill-begotten society that did not hesitate to trample on one's honor and remain imperturbable, even when faced with crushing proofs of his disloyalty. Then, when he told her that he had been with his confessor that afternoon, she feared she would go blind with rage. Ever since her days at the academy, she had been convinced that the men and women of the church lacked any virtue inspired by God. This was a discordant note in the harmony of the house, which they had managed to overlook without mishap. But her husband's allowing his confessor to be privy to an intimacy that was not only his, but hers as well, was more than she could bear. You might as well have told a snake charmer in the market, she said. For her, it was the end of everything. She was sure that her honor was the subject of subject of gossip even before her husband had finished his penance and the feeling of humiliation that this produced in her was much less tolerable than the shame and anger and injustice caused by his infidelity and worst of all damn it with a black woman he corrected her with a mulata but by then it was too late for ac accuracy she had finished finished just as bad she said and only now i understand it it was the smell of a black woman This happened on a Monday, on Friday at seven o'clock in the evening. Fermina Daza sailed away on the regular boat to San Juan de la Cienaga with only one trunk in the company of her goddaughter, her face covered by a mantilla to avoid questions for herself and for and her husband, Dr. Juvenal Urbino, was not at the dock by mutual agreement. Following an exhausting three-day discussion in which they decided she should go to cousin Hildebranda Sanchez's ridge, ranch in Flores de Maria for as long a time as she needed to think before coming to a final decision. Without knowing her reasons, the children understood it was a trip she had often put off that they themselves had wanted her to make for a long time. Dr. Rubino arranged matters so that no one in his perfidious circle could engage in a malicious speculation, and he did it so well that if Florentino Ariza could find no clue to Fermina Daza's disappearance, it was because, in fact, there was none, not because he lacked the means to investigate. Her husband had no doubts that she would come home as soon as she got over her rage, but she left certain that her rage would never end. However, she was going to learn very soon that her drastic decision was not so much the fruit of resentment as of nostalgia. After their honeymoon, she had returned several times to Europe, despite the ten days at sea, and she had always made the trip with more than enough time to enjoy it. She knew the world. She had learned to live and think in new ways, but she had never gone back to San Juan de la Cienaga after the aborted flight in the balloon. To her mind, there was an element of redemption in the return to Cousin Hildebrandus, Hildebrandus province, no matter how belated. This was not her response to her marital catastrophe. The idea was much older than that, so the mere thought of her visiting her adolescent haunts consoled her in her unhappiness. When she disembarked with her goddaughter in San Juan de la Cienaga, she called on the great reserves of her character and recognized the town despite all the evidence to the contrary. The civil and military commander of the city, who had been advised of her arrival, invited her for a drive in the official Victoria while the train was preparing to leave for San Pedro Alejandrino, which she wanted to visit in order to see for herself, if what they said was true, that the bed in which the liberator had died was as small as a child. It's kind of a weird thing to want to see. Uh, then Fermina Daza saw her town again in the som somnolence of two o'clock in the afternoon. She saw the streets that seemed more like beaches with scum-covered pools, and she saw the mansions of the Portuguese with their coats of arms carved over the entrance and bronze jalousies at the windows, where the same hesitant, sad piano exercises that her recently married mother had taught to the daughters of the wealthy houses were repeated without mercy in the gloom of the salons. She saw the deserted plaza with no trees growing in their burning lamps of sodium nitrate, the line of carriages with their funer funereal tops and their horses asleep where they stood, the yellow train to San Pedro Ale Alejandrino, and on the corner next to the largest church, she saw the biggest and most beautiful of the houses with an arcaded passageway of greenish stone and its great monastery door and the window of the bedroom where Alvaro would be born many years later when she no longer had the memory to remember it. Hmm. She thought of Aunt Escolastica, for whom she continued her hopeless search in heaven and on earth, 
thinking of her, she found herself thinking of Florentino Ariza with his literary clothes and his book of poems under the almond trees in the little park, as she did on rare occasions when she recalled her unpleasant days at the academy. She drove around and around, but she could not recognize the old family house for where she supposed it to be. She found only a pigsty, and around the corner was a street lined with brothels where whores from all over the world took their siestas in the doorways in case there was something for them in the mail. It was not the same town. When they began their drive, Fermina Daza had covered the lower half of her face with her mantilla, not for fear of being recognized in a place where no one could have known her, no one could know her because of the dead bodies she saw everywhere, but because of the dead bodies she saw everywhere, from the railroad station to the cemetery bloating in the sun. The civil and military commander of the city told her, it's cholera. She knew it was because she had seen the white lumps in the mouths of the sweltering course corpses, and she noted that none of the, them had the coup de grace in the back of the neck as they had at the time of the balloon. That is true, said the officer. Even God improves his methods. The distance from San Juan de la Cienaga to the old plantation of San Pan Pedro Alejandrino was only nine leagues, but the yellow train took the entire day to make the trip because the engineer was a friend of the regular passengers who were always asking him to please stop so they could stretch their legs by strolling across the golf course horses of the banana company, and the men bathed naked in the clear cold rivers that rushed down from the mountains, and where, when they were hungry, they got off the train to milk the cows wandering in the pastures. Fermina Daza was terrified at uh, when they reached their destination, and she just had time to marvel at the Homeric tamarinds, where the liberator had hung, hung his dying man's hammock, and to confirm that the bed where he had died, just as they had said, was small, not only for so glorious a man, but even for a seven-month-old infant. Another visitor, however, who seemed very well informed, said that the bed was a false relic, for the truth was that the father, father of his co country had... Oh, let's see. Another visitor, however, who seemed very well informed, said that the bed was a false relic, for the truth was that the father of his country had been left to die on the floor. Fermina Daza was so depressed by what she had seen and heard since she left her house for that rest of the trip, she took no pleasure in the memory of her earlier trip, as she had longed to do, but instead she avoided passing through the villages of her nostalgia. In this way, she could still keep them, and keep herself from disillusionment. She heard the accordions in her detours around disenchantment, she heard the shouts from the cockfighting cock pits, the bursts of gunfire that could just as well signal war as revelry, and when she had no other recourse and had to pass through a village, she covered her face with her mantilla so, no, so that she could remember it as it had once been. Uh, near the bottom, or middle bottom of 253. Right. One night. After so much avoidance of the past, she arrived at Cousin Hildebrand's ranch, and when she saw her waiting at the door, she almost fainted. It was as if she were seeing herself in the mirror of truth. She was fat and old, burdened with unruly children whose father was not the man she still loved without hope, but a soldier living on his pension, whom she had married out of spite, and who loved her to distraction. But she was still the same person inside her ruined body. Fermina Daza recovered from her shock after a few days of country living and pleasant memories, but she did not leave the ranch except to go to mass on Sundays with the grandchildren of her wayward conspirators of long ago cowboys on magnificent horses and beautiful well-dressed girls who were just like their mothers at their age and who rode standing in ox carts and singing chorus until they reached the mission church at the end of the valley she only passed through the village of flores de maria where she had not gone on her earlier trip because she had not thought she would like it but she saw when she saw it she was fascinated her misfortune or the villages was that she could never remember it afterward as it was in reality, but only as she had imagined it before she had been there. Dr. Juvenal Urbino made the decision to come for her after receiving a report from the Bishop of Riojacha, who had concluded that, sorry, I didn't move something, uh, had concluded that his wife's long stay was caused not by her unwillingness to return, but by her inability to find a way around her pride. So he went without notifying her at an exchange uh, notifying her after an exchange of letters with Hilda Branda, in which it was made clear that his wife was filled with nostalgia. Now she only thought of home. At 11 o'clock in the morning, Fermina Daza was in the kitchen preparing stuffed eggplant when she heard the shouts of the peons, the neighboring, neighing of the horses, the shooting of guns in the air, and the resolute steps in the courtyard, and the man's voice. 
It is better to arrive in time than to be invited. She thought she would die of joy. Without time to think about it, she washed her hands as well as she could with, while she murmured, Thank you, God. Thank you. How good you are. Thinking that she had not bathed yet because of the damned eggplant that Hildebranda had asked her to prepare without telling her who was coming to lunch. Thinking that she looked so ugly, old and ugly that her face was so raw from the sun that he would regret having come to s and uh, having come when he saw her like this, damn it. But she dried her hands the best she could on her apron, arranged her appearance the best she could, called on the, all the haughtiness she had been born with to calm her maddened heart, and went to meet the man with her sweet doe's gait, her head high, her eyes shining, her nose ready for battle, and grateful to her fate for the immense, immense relief of going home. But not as pliant as he thought, of course, because she would be happy to leave him. Of course, she was also determined to make him pay with her silence for the bitter suffering that had entered her life. Almost two years after the disappearance of Fermina Daza, an impossible coincidence occurred, the sort that Transito Ariza would have characterized as one of God's jokes. Florentino Ariza had not been impressed but in any special way by the invention of moving pictures, but Leona Cassiani took him unre unresisting to the spectacular opening of Cabri. Cabiria, whose reputation was based on the dialogues written by the poet Gabriele D'Annunzio. The great open-air patio of Don Galileo da Conte, where on some nights uh, one enjoyed the splendor of the stars more than the silent lovemaking on the screen, was filled to overflowing with a, uh, with a select public. Leona Cassiani followed the wandering plot with her heart in her mouth. Florentino Ariza, on the other hand, was nodding his head in sleep because of the overwhelming tedium of the drama. At his back, a woman's voice seemed to read his thoughts. My God, this is longer than sorrow! <laughs> that was all she said, inhibited perhaps by the resonance of her voice in the darkness, for the custom of embellishing silent films with piano accompaniment had not been yet established there, and in darkened enclosure, all that one could hear was the projector murmuring like rain. Florentino Ariza did not think of God except in the most extreme circumstances, but now he thanked him with all his heart. For every twenty fathoms under, underground, he would instantly have recognized the husky voice he had carried in his soul ever since the afternoon. When he, excuse me, when he heard her say in a swirl of yellow leaves in a solitary park, Now go and don't come back until I tell you, he knew that he was sitting in the seat behind his. She was sitting in the seat behind his. Next to her inevitable husband, and he could detect her warm, her warm, even breathing, and she, let's see, let's go back, he knew that she was sitting in the seat behind his, next to her inevitable husband, and he could detect her warm, even breathing as he inhaled with love the air purified by the health of her breath. Instead of imagining her under attack by the devouring worms of death, as he had in his despondency of recent months, he recalled called her at a radiant and joyful age, her belly rounded under the Minervan tunic with the seed of her first child. In utter detachment from the historical disasters that were crowding the screen, he did not need to turn around to see her in his imagination. He delighted in the scent of almonds that came wafting back to him from his innermost being, and he longed to know how she thought women in films should fall in love so that their loves would cause less pain than they did in life. Just before the film ended, he realized in a flash of exultation that he had never been so close, so long, to the one he loved so much. When the lights went on, he waited for the others to stand up. Then he stood unhurried and turned around in a distracted way as he buttoned his vest that he always opened during a performance, and the four of them found themselves so close to one another that they would have been obliged to exchange greetings even if one of them had not wanted to. First, Juvenal Urbino greeted Leona Cassiani, whom he knew well, and then he shook Florentino Riza's hand with his customary gallantry. Fermina Daza smiled at both of them with courtesy, only courtesy, but in any event with the smile of someone who had seen them often, who knew the, who they were and who therefore did not need an introduction. Leona Cassiani responded with her mulata grace, but Florentino Riza did not know what to do because he was flabbergasted at the sight of her. She was another person. There was no sign in her face of the terrible disease that was in fashion or of any other illness, 
and her body had kept the proportion and slenderness of her better days. But it was evident in the, la evident in the last two years had been as hard on her as ten difficult ones. Her short hair was becoming, with a curved wing on each cheek, but it was the color of an of aluminum, not honey, and belong and behind her grandmother's spectacles, her beautiful lanceolate that must be a color eyes had lost half a lifetime of light. Florentino Ariza saw her move away from her husband's arm in the crowd that was leaving the theater, and he was surprised that she was in a public place wearing a poor woman's mantilla and house slippers. But what moved him most was that her husband had to take her arm to help her at the exit, and even then she miscalculated the height of the step and almost tripped on the stairs at the door. Florentino Ariza was very sensitive to the faltering steps of old age. Even as a young man, he would interpret his reading of poetry in the park to observe elderly couples who helped each other cross across the street and they were lessons in life that had aided him in detecting the laws of his own aging. Um, at Dr. Juvenal Urbino's time of life, that night in the film, men blossomed in a kind of autumnal youth. They seemed more dignified with their first gray hairs They became witty and seductive, above all in the eyes of young women, while their withered wives had to clutch at their arms so as to not trip over their own shadows. A few years later, however, the husbands fell without warning down the precipice of a humiliating aging in body and soul, and then it was their wives who recovered and had to lead them by the arm as if they were blind men on charity, whispering in their ear in order not to wound their masculine pride, that they should be careful, that there were three steps, not two, that there was a puddle in the middle of the street, that the shape lying across the sidewalk was a dead beggar, and with great difficulty helped them to cross the street as if it were the only ford across the last of, of life's lip rivers. Florentino Ariza had seen himself reflected so often in that mirror that he was never afraid, as afraid of death as he was of reaching that humiliating age when he would have to be led on a woman's arm. On that day, and only on that day, he knew he would have to renounce his hope of Fermina Daza. Top of 257. Mm. Mm. The meeting frightened away sleep. Instead of driving Leona Cassiani in the carriage, he walked with her through the old city where their footsteps echoed like horses' hooves on the cobblestones. From time to time, fragments of fugitive voices escaped through the open balconies, bedroom confidences, sobs of love magnified by phantasmal acoustics, and the hot fragrance of jasmine in the narrow uh, sleeping streets. In the narrow sleeping streets. Once again, Florentino Ariza had to summon all his strength not to reveal to Leona Cassiani his repressed love for Fermina Daza. They walked together with measured steps, loving each other like unhurried old sweethearts, she thinking about the charms of Cabiria and he thinking about his own misfortune. A man was singing on a balcony in the plaza of the custom house, and his song was repeated throughout the area in a chain of echoes. When I was sailing across the immense waves of the sea, on Saints of Sone Street, just when he should have said goodnight at her door, Florentino Ariza asked Leone Cassiani to invite him in for a brandy. It was the second time he had made such a request to her under comparable circumstances. The first time, ten years before, she had said to him, If you come in at this hour, you will have to stay forever. He did not go in, but he would do so now, even if he had to break his word afterwards. Nevertheless, Cass uh, Leone, Leona Cassiani invited him in and asked him for no promises. That was how he found himself when he least expected it, in the sanctuary of a love that had been distinguished before it was born. Her parents had died, her only brother had made his fortune in Curacho, and she was living alone in the fa old family house. Years before, when he had still not renounced the hope of making her his lover, with the consent, consent of her parents, Florentino Ariza, would visit her on Sundays, and sometimes until very late at night, and he had contributed so much to the household that he came to consider it his own. But that night, after the film, he had the feeling that his memory had been erased from the drawing room. The furniture had been moved, there were new prints hanging the wall on the walls, and he thought so many heartless changes had been made in order to perpetuate the certainty that he had never lived. The cat did not recognize him. Dismayed by the cruelty of oblivion, he said, he does not remember me anymore. 
but she replied over her shoulder as she was fixing the brandies that if he was bothered by that, he could rest easy because cats do not remember anyone. Leaning back as they leaning back as they sat close together on the sofa, they spoke about themselves, about they what they had been before they met one afternoon, who knows lo how long ago, on the mule drawn trolley. Their lives were spent in adjacent offices, and until now they had never spoken of anything except their daily work. Also they talked as they talked, Florentino Ariza put his hand on her thigh. He began to caress her with the gentle touch of an experienced seducer, and she did not stop him, but she did not respond either, not even with a shudder for courtesy's sake. Only when he tried to go further did she grasp his exploratory hand and kiss him on the palm. Behave yourself, she said. I realized a long time ago that you are not the man I, w I am looking for. While she was still very young, a strong, able man, whose face she never saw, took her by surprise, threw her down on the jetty, ripped her clothes off, and made instantaneous and frenetic love to her. Lying there on, on the rocks, her body covered with cuts and bruises, she had wanted that man to stay forever so that she could die of love in his arms. She had not seen his face, she had not heard his voice, but she was sure she would have known him in a crowd of a thousand men because of the shape and size and his way of making love. From that time on, she would say to anyone who would listen to her, if you ever hear of a big strong fellow who raped a poor black girl on the street of drowned men's jetty one October 15th at about half past 11 at night, tell him where he can find me. She said it out of habit and she had said it to so many people that she no longer had any hope. Florentino Ariza had heard the story as many times as he had heard about sailing away in the night. By two o'clock in the morning, they had each drunk three brandies, and he knew, in truth, he was not the man she was waiting for, and he was glad to know it. Bravo, lion lady, he said when he left. We have killed the tiger. And I'm going to stop there. Top of 259.